and welcome to Candidate Conversations. My name is Alan Dennis, and I'm the state government reporter with the Spokesman Review newspaper. Today, I'm joined by Senator Patty Cooter, a Democrat running for state insurance commissioner. Patty, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for the invitation, Ellen. It's a pleasure. Um, my first question for you is give us your pitch. Why are you running for this office and why should the voters of Washington pick you? Well, um, I'll start by saying that uh, I know about the importance of this office. I know about the importance of it first and foremost as a trial attorney, having represented uh, hundreds of clients on insurance matters. Uh, and also as a legislator, I've worked directly with the OIC on many, many bills, including uh, for this last session, three of which passed both chambers unanimously, and the fourth, a very large pharmacy benefit manager bill that passed with very strong bipartisan support. So I know the importance of it for uh, the consumers, and the role of the insurance commissioner is to be a consumer advocate. So I have that uh, in my blood. Uh, that's what I did as a trial attorney. It's what I've done as a legislator, and it's the attitude and the um, motivation that brings me to the OIC. Uh, I also am very motivated by health care. Uh, that's really that is really what's um, got me uh, interested in the position in the first place, because a few years ago we passed a, a law to create a universal health care commission. Uh, and the goal of that commission was to uh, look at ways that we could bring health care to all Washingtonians to make sure they had access to good quality health care. And we intentionally put the insurance commissioner on that commission. Now, I voted for that bill. I was sponsor of that bill. And that bill um, was not just lip service for me. That was a really important um vote for me because it was a real statement that we were going to move in that direction. And given my own personal history with having health care denied to my little baby when she was born uh, and in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit for five months, I know what it's like uh, to have to fight to get uh, the, your insurance company to pay for health care. And I don't think you should have to be a lawyer and you shouldn't have to be a legislator in order to have access to quality health care in this country and in this state. And so that's that's what's motivating me for the role. You mentioned that you worked on four bills with the Office of the Insurance Commissioner. Could you talk a little bit more about those? Sure. Uh, well, um, uh, the biggest one was the Pharmacy Benefit Manager Bill. Uh, that is a bill that puts some guardrails on pharmacy benefit managers and how they conduct business in our state. It gives the authority to the insurance commissioner uh, to look at their practices. And it, you know, quite frankly, it puts consumer protections uh, into law. And it is designed to help our independent pharmacists, especially those in uh, rural areas that have uh, seen pharmacy benefit managers do things called clawbacks and rebate splitting and really undercut our local pharmacists quite a bit. And this will give them some protections. It also helps them with the appeals process so that they can uh, challenge what they um, consider an unfair practice by a pharmacy benefit manager. So a very important bill, like I said, it was very uh, strongly bipartisan. Uh, Senator Shelley Short from Northeastern uh, Washington was my number two co-sponsor on that bill. The other three um, dealt with uh, insurance at homeowners um, in general. Uh, for example, one bill gave um, homeowners an extra 15 days to find coverage when they were issued a non-renewal notice. We're seeing that more and more, and not just in you know places where we've seen more wildfires. It's happening all over the state where individuals are getting a non-renewal notice from their company and they don't know why they're being non-renewed. This gives them an additional 15 days to find alternate coverage. And thankfully in Washington, um, there is there are options out there for folks. And I've heard from independent agents who've told me that that 15 days actually makes quite a difference for their insureds. Um, we also had a bill that protects social security numbers uh, from insurance companies uh, inadvertently disclosing those. Uh, this is something that has been uh, an issue that I have seen in my practice as a trial attorney 
for many, many years. And this simply requires them to, they can't ask for that information unless they absolutely need it in order to verify child support information. So that was that bill. Um, and then uh, the other one was, um, well, we had a bill that was going to make insurance in plain language. That one did not pass, unfortunately. Uh, that was uh, a bill that I think is really, really important because a lot of times what we hear from people is that they have, um, you know, they thought they had coverage for a certain event and they will hear from an adjuster that they do have that coverage, but just not for this event that happened to them. Uh, that is a bill that as insurance commissioner, I'd like to see come back. I think that that is a really uh, important bill uh, to have in place so that people have uh, the, you know, the, the security of knowing um, that, you know, that they, they understand what they're buying. And I think that's really important. Um, other than the insurance in plain language effort, if you're elected as insurance commissioner, what would be at the top of your to-do list once you take office? Well, there's a lot of at the top of the list because there are a lot of issues that are facing the state when it comes to insurance. I've been around um, going around the state for over a year now, and these are the issues that I hear the most about. Healthcare, and that is both in terms of cost and access, and that also includes um, access to mental health uh, care. Um, I also hear a lot about um, auto premiums being too high and also homeowners. And homeowners is not just the cost of the, the homeowners itself, but it's also these non-renewal notices that they've been getting. So those are going to be you know, foremost at the OIC's uh, priority list. Um, a lot of the non-renewal notices are given to those who are in designated wildfire zones. And each insurance company has their own definition of what is a wildfire zone. There's really no uniformity there. I think there's a conversation to be had in terms of um, should there be? Uh, do we want to have that? Or do we want to have it more individual based on insurer? Um, but I also think there's a conversation to be had about what insureds can do to reduce their risk in the first place so that they don't receive a non-renewal notice. And that's information that the insurers have. They know when they are making a risk assessment, they know what factors they're looking at. Have they communicated those factors to the insured? Have they given them time to deal with whatever the issue may be so that they can make sure that they remain insurable? I think transparency is a really big issue when it comes to insurance. And I want to have more transparency in the insurance industry so insureds can do what they need to do in order to um, reduce their risk and stay insured. Recent hospital mergers um, and uh, more attempts to do so in Washington, and not just hospitals, but healthcare systems in general, have been a big thing in the news. Um, I know there was legislation attempted that ultimately did not pass that would have put guardrails around future hospital mergers. And as the um, insurance commissioner, what role would you have in working, um, I guess, to protect consumers from any effects of a hospital or healthcare system merger? Um, or, you know, if there are effects if one doesn't happen or something. So kind of what role would you play in protecting consumers there? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, the role, obviously, is not to pass that law. Uh, that would be up to the legislature to do that. But, you know, to make sure that the, the networks are adequate once those mergers happen. Uh, we have already passed network adequacy standards. Um, and the insurance commissioner's office has been very focused on the issue of healthcare and network adequacy for, for one of the issues uh, related to healthcare. And it's work that I will continue for sure, um, because I do think that the mergers with the mergers, uh, you know, my general sense is that that's not always best for consumers. It can be, but it certainly depends on the circumstances. And the hospital systems 
I hope your viewers appreciate that there's a difference between a rural hospital and the issues that are facing them and an urban hospital. And I think the rural hospitals are in a different situation altogether and need um, more resources than say the urban hospitals do. And I do think that the role of the insurance commissioner will be to work collaboratively with the legislature to be um, a resource for them to, to do the research, to pre present the evidence and the data so that the legislators can make the best informed decision that they need to make on behalf of the citizens of the state when it comes to hospital mergers. The cost of auto insurance in the state has made a lot of headlines in recent months and years. Um, how would you address people's concerns with being able to afford auto insurance if you're elected. Yeah, that is, you know, it's it's a real issue. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons that go into that. First of all, I want people to understand that Washington isn't unique in having this play out. Uh, there are, you know, spikes in in auto and homeowners across the country. It doesn't make a, it 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 hits your pocketbook any less, but I just want to want people to know that this is happening across the board. Um, one of the largest drivers of the increase in auto premiums are claims. And the claims for property damage in particular, because the cars um, are, it's, it's way more costly to repair these vehicles today that are the smart vehicles. Tesla is, is a classic example. And in the insurers that I've spoken with, some of them have talked about that there, maybe there should be a, you know, in an, in an, a Tesla premium tax or a, not a tax, but a, an increase in their premiums alone for the fact that it is a Tesla, because when they take the Tesla in for even a minor repair to a repair shop. I, uh, one of the insurers told me that they have to pay for like four bays on either side of the bay that the Tesla is in to keep them vacant in case the battery starts on fire and causes more damage. You know, so it is really expensive uh, to deal with um, the cars today for, for repairs. And the supply chain issue still remains to be, um, is still a problem for insurers. So you, you add that on top of the fact that when these, car, these cars are heavier and when they hit someone, uh, the injuries tend to be even more severe. So that's the backdrop, uh, you know, but what can we do preventatively? Well, one of the things is you get a discount if you're, let's say your teenager has had driver's ed, but we took driver's ed out of the schools. And so that means there's a certain percentage of the population, uh, low-income families in particular, that can't afford 911 driving school. And so they're not going to be able to avail themselves of, of um, the training or the discount. And I think that that is really something that we should be looking at. How do we make driver's ed more accessible? How do we fix um, intersections and roadways that we know are inherently dangerous that contribute to accidents? I think we could actually look at reducing the blood alcohol content. There was a bill I was a co-sponsor of that bill in the Senate to reduce it from 08 to 05. That will reduce the number of accidents. And anytime you're reducing accidents, you're reducing claims, you're reducing payouts by insurance companies. And that, of course, can keep the premiums lower. So these are some things that I think we need to look at in addition to how do we solve the uninsured motorist percentage that we have in our, in our state. So those are the things that I'll be focused on uh, as insurance commissioner, because I do think we need to to look at what are the best ways we can to reduce the, the cost for consumers across the state. What would you say sets you apart from your opponent in this race for insurance commissioner? Well, I think first and foremost is that I am, I have a proven track record of being a consumer advocate, both as a lawyer and as a legislator. And the job of the insurance commissioner is not just to provide oversight and regulation of the insurance industry. It is also to act in the public interest, which means that the commissioner is to be a consumer advocate. And I think the legislators, when they pass this law creating uh, the insurance commissioner position and made it uh, a position that was to be elected by the people, I think they had in mind two things. One, 
They didn't want the commissioner to be accountable to one person, i.e. the governor. They wanted that person to be accountable to the people. And secondly, I think they wanted um, that person to be independent to act in the consumer, uh, the consumer interest. And I think that that's really important because they understood that there is an inherent power imbalance between insurance companies and insureds. And having taken on insurance companies in the past, I think that I am the best equipped uh, to do that going forward. Is there anything I haven't asked you about so far that you would like voters to know about your campaign? Well, that it's people powered. Uh, I am getting a lot of bipartisan support across the state because like I said, um, insurance is really a bipartisan issue. Um, it affects us all the same at the same in the same way. It is not just about uh, the you know um, the amount of money that it brings into our economy, but it's also um, in an individual's financial security at stake. And I take that responsibility very, very seriously. Um, just like I know, as I said at the beginning of our conversation, I know the importance of the insurance commissioner's office. And I think my training, this is another reason I, that, and this is another thing that sets me apart from my opponent. Um, I have practiced in employment law my entire career, and I know what a respectful workplace looks like. And there have been some issues at the insurance commissioner's office in the last few years when it comes to um, the working environment and, uh, and morale at the OIC. I know that in addition to doing the statutory job that is um, delineated for the insurance commissioner, that whoever gets in there will be in a rebuilding mode and will need to lead from the top down in terms of the vision for what the workplace should should function like. And I can tell you in, in my experience, having represented employers and having represented employees who have had to sue their employers, I know the type of employer that gets sued the most in my experience. And that is the employer that says, you work for me rather than you work with me as a team. And I think um, that's the that's who I am. I'm a you work with me kind of person. And that's, you know, the leadership style that I will bring to the OIC. And, uh, you know, you need to rebuild morale there. And that takes time. You're not going to instantly go in and have trust with people. And so that is really going to be you got to walk the walk, you know. Um, as my dad used to say, you say what you mean and you mean what you say. And as I would tell my kids when they were little, it doesn't cost you anything to be kind. So I'm not going to tolerate um, a hostile working environment by anybody. I know the difference between a performance issue and a conduct issue. And I will have zero tolerance for bad conduct. Uh, we, can, we need to understand that we will be working together as a team on behalf of the consumers of this state. And that is, like I said, my orientation. It's how I have conducted myself in my law firms. It's how I've conducted myself in my legislative career. And it's how I will conduct myself as the next insurance commissioner for Washington state. I think that is all of the questions I had for you. Um, did you have anything else to add? I don't think so. I just really appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to talk to your viewers and, and your listeners. And I will say, you know, it's a down ballot race. Um, it's not top of mind for everybody. Uh, but I do want folks to understand it is a really important office. If they have any questions about it at all, I have been fielding questions, emails, phone calls um, from around the state please just feel free to, to reach out and, and give me a call. Uh, you know, we are, um, like I said, a people powered campaign, and this is really about making sure everyone has a voice at the table. And when we are in the midst of solving problems, you know, I don't necessarily think every problem dissolves or involves a law. You don't always have to pass a law or you don't always have to start a lawsuit to solve a problem, a legal problem either. 
you know, I think the best way to solve these problems though, is to have all of the stakeholders at the table talking these out. Because as I've said to the insurers and the insureds alike around the state of Washington, you can have a strong consumer advocate in the role of insurance commissioner and a healthy, strong insurance market that is competitive and that provides the best prices for the consumers here. Those two are not mutually exclusive. You can have those together. And that's going to be the overarching goal that, that I will be working towards as com insurance commissioner. Well, Senator Couture, on behalf of the Spokesman Review and voters in Washington, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me today about your campaign. Happy to. Thanks so much. Yeah. Um, the insurance commissioner race will be one of several statewide executive races on the ballot. Um, ballots are due postmarked or in county drop boxes by 8 p.m. on November 5th.